if you aren't there already, turn back in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, where we'll be having a look at the first eight verses. Now, when I first read this passage, my first thought was, oh my, (laughs) cast your bread upon the waters, what does that mean? I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is standing at the bunny park throwing bread for the ducks and geese. And I'm, I'm no RC sprawl, but I somehow don't think that's what Solomon had in mind. Now, the other challenge that this passage has is that there's a lot. There's a lot here in these eight verses, a lot to go through in 25 minutes. So what I'm going to be doing is, is trying to teach the big idea that I think the preacher, Solomon, has in mind and is trying to convey to us, and that is just simply how we can live responsible, meaningful lives in the midst of a world filled with vanity. So the preacher, you'll remember, has been unpacking and helping us to see throughout the book thus far that life apart from God is really quite silly and meaningless. A few weeks ago, we we heard Stephen showing us from Ecclesiastes 9 verses 7 to 10 that even though a lot of this life is vanity, in its proper place, if we don't idolize the things God's given us to enjoy, we really can enjoy many of the experiences and things of this world. Even within the vanity, if we will not worship these things and experiences, as we do that, it puts us in a position to actually enjoy them. And in the passage that Tommy preached last week, the preacher alluded to some of these gifts of God, saying, bread is made for laughter and wine gladdens life. So if we see these things as gifts, gifts given to us by a good God, then that, that frees us from the vanity um, of, of, seeing, of trying to get full satisfaction out of these things. But as we approach this final stretch of the book, the the preacher is continuing to show us how we can correctly invest the vain things of this world and actually get a solid return uh, in eternity. And that that return is going to transcend this earthly vanity which which we live in and which we see all around us and which we're confronted with day in and day out. Now, since Doug has already read our passage to us, I'm not going to go and read that all again, but you can refer to that as we go through. Um, But as we dive into these bread-laden waters, uh, we want to do so just organizing our thoughts under four simple headings. The first is from verses 1 to 2, we'll be looking at wise reasoning. Then from verse 3, we're going to be looking at trusting children. From verses 4 to 7, diligent stewards. And verse 8, dark days. Wise reasoning, trusting children, diligent stewards, and dark days. So verses 1 to 2, wise reasoning. Oftentimes we counsel one another in times of trial to trust God in the midst of the trial because of what we know to be true about Him. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29, well-known verse says, The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do them. So we we rightly and we wisely counsel one another that since we know that God is good and gracious and merciful and He is our Father who loves us, we can then trust in that character even when it seems like life is contradicting what we know. We regularly interpret the less clear text of Scripture by the more clear text of Scripture. Now, this is good and wise counsel and we should continue to do it and live by it. But here the preacher seems to be counseling us to do the very opposite. Instead of reasoning from the known to the unknown, rather we should be reasoning from the unknown to the known. We should take all that we do not know, and that should shape our perspective and our attitude towards what we do know, or what we think we know anyway. Solomon speaks in verses 1 and 2 to living generously. Cast your bread upon the waters, he says. In other words, we want to be generous and give to others without worrying about storing up for the future. In verse 2, he says, give a portion to seven or even to eight. And we know that to the Hebrew, the number seven represented completeness. So here he's saying, give generously to everybody and then add some on top of that, not worrying about the future. And what's behind that counsel? Well, he says, For you do not know what disaster may happen on the earth. For you do not know what disaster may happen on the earth. Now that that goes directly contrary to worldly wisdom. We would say that since we don't know what disaster is going to happen on the earth, therefore we must save up and store up for the future. Stockpile. 
Save up for a rainy day, we all teach our children. But Solomon says, because we don't know what the future holds, therefore we must give generously. Do you see that reasoning from the unknown to the known? Because we don't know the future, therefore be generous. All the way through this book, Solomon has been highlighting the vanity that is inherent in all of life. And now as we approach this conclusion of his teaching, we're seeing some very practical application. So rather than taking life so seriously, overly seriously, since it's all vanity, we should be holding on to this life and the things of this life a lot more loosely. This is the effect of heavenly wisdom. Because we know this life is vanity, therefore we can truly enjoy things like marriage and food and clothing. It's when we take this all too seriously and we look to it for our satisfaction and for meaning, that's when we find ourselves hit over and over in the face by the meaninglessness of it all. Our meaning must be sought elsewhere. So we ought to be approaching generosity almost like we would an investment, he seems to be saying. We, we have the assurance here that we will get a return. So he says, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. You'll find it after many days. So in investing, we know that you always need to take the long approach. You don't invest in something today and then take your money out again the next day. You're going to lose money that way. You need to take the long-term approach. You're going to sacrifice now. You're going to put money away now in order to gain later. But if Solomon is just saying here that we need to be generous in order to get a return in this life, then that, that would seem to contradict everything that he's been teaching us throughout the book thus far. I believe that he's helping us to see that because this life is vain and because we all live not knowing the future, therefore we should not be investing in this life, but we should be investing the things in this life for eternity. So although I've phrased this point reasoning from the unknown to the known, I've actually employed something like clickbait. If you don't know what clickbait is, it's, it's basically where you give a title, a provocative or controversial title to like a YouTube video or a, a post just to get someone to click on it, just to open that thing that you probably wouldn't have opened otherwise. So how have I employed clickbait tonight, you might be asking. So although it will appear on the surface that Solomon is telling us to reason from the unknown to the known, in fact, what he's really doing is helping us to see that what we really need is something far more certain than this life can offer. Rather than needing to know what tomorrow will bring in the cycle of vanity, we need to know what we can count on outside the vanity. We need to be looking to life beyond or life above the sun. And as Christians, then, we can hold loosely onto the things of this world precisely because we know this world is not our home. We're not looking for meaning in this world. So in light of the uncertainty of tomorrow, give generously because God will reward you. You don't want to miss out, he's saying, on investing opportunities in God's economy. So invest generously today because you don't know what disaster tomorrow may bring. You may not have opportunity tomorrow to invest further in God's economy. Jesus promised us in Luke 18, 29, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. And Hebrews 11, 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Matthew 6, verse 6 says, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So family, this is a little bit like being told to take your monopoly money and invest it generously to get a return in actual dollars. Not in Zim dollars, that is monopoly money, but in actual dollars. Can you see how foolish it is for us to hold on and hoard our monopoly money when we're being told that if you invest this paper you're going to get something substantial in, reward, in return. Invest generously in the kingdom, be it through, through gifts, through missions giving, through giving your time, through your energy, through your expertise, however it is that you're investing in the kingdom, do it generously and you will find your return after many days. 
So this is the wise reasoning that Solomon is counseling us to employ. Now let's, let's go on to look at how he's calling us to, to live and act as trusting children. So verse 3, trusting children. Much of the wisdom literature is devoted to self-control and contentment. Much of the wisdom literature, including and I think especially Ecclesiastes, urges us to take careful note of the fact that we are living in a sin-cursed and broken world. The world is not currently the way that God created it to be. Because of man's rebellion against God's authority, and because of the fact that God put man in charge and gave Adam responsibility over all of creation, when Adam sinned against the Lord, he plunged all of mankind, but also all of creation, into vanity and a curse, into decay. Previously, Adam was commanded by God to be fruitful and multiply and take dominion and subdue the earth. Before the fall, this would, would have been immensely enjoyable and productive and fruitful. There would have been no frustration. There would have been all joy and pleasure in the task. There would have been no, no frustration. But after the fall, the ground produced thorns and weeds. Crops were not as plentiful. Took sweat. Famines and droughts plagued the earth. And there was pain in work, pain in child rearing. This curse, I think, is something of a foretaste of God's judgment on sin. So we are reminded that there is a need for us and for this whole world to be redeemed. We need a way for, to atone for our brokenness, this inherited brokenness that we got from Adam, which inclines us to sin and rebel against God continually. So God sent His Son, the Lord Jesus, not only to atone for our sin, but also to make us righteous. He did this for all who would repent of their wickedness and put their, tra their, their faith and their hope in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, in his death and his burial and resurrection. When we repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then something wonderful happens. Within our own hearts, we begin to experience something of an undoing of the curse, something of a restoration um, of, of the way, the, the, of the wholeness that God created us with. We experience healing and wholeness where previously there had only been disease and brokenness. And then this, this healing and restoration spills over to other areas of life and into all creation as well as the Holy Spirit brings the fruit of obedience to bear in, in all our relationships and politics and uh, culture. Now, this undoing of the curse is, in, is an inevitable byproduct of the gospel. And it's a big part of the Great Commission. We're told that we need to go out and make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, teaching them to obey all that God had commanded. And as we see more and more of the, the kingdom of God coming on the earth and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covering the earth as the waters cover the sea, so we see less and less decay and more and more wholeness and restoration. But until evil and sin is completely removed... Even we as Christians must continue to live in a broken and sin-cursed world. We're still plagued daily by the effects of the curse, by disease, decay, sinful desires in our own flesh, as well as the sin of others which affects our lives. Much of wisdom, much of godly biblical wisdom, means that we can live with contentment even in the midst of this decay and brokenness. Because we, we know that one day things will be different knowing that God has a plan for his name to be glorified as he redeems this broken world. Wisdom is in large part arresting in the sovereignty of God, living not as frustrated slaves, but as trusting children. Solomon referred previously to this monotonous repetition of, of earthly rhythms, natural rhythms, and, and he does so again here. He says, if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. So wisdom, in large part, means resting in God's hands, even though the world is still full of decay. The fact that trees fall in the first place speaks to the decay that's inherent in the world and in creation. When it's time for it to rain, it will rain, and there's nothing that you can do about it, whether it's your wedding day or otherwise. When a tree falls, it's going to fall to the ground, pointing some direction. And where it falls, there it will lie, whether you like it or not. So rather than getting all worked up and frustrated 
that we live in a sin-cursed world and a, a world which continually and relentlessly expresses this decay and brokenness, we as Christians should rather rest secure in the knowledge that God is king even over this apparent chaos. Jesus refers us to this sort of wisdom when he urges his disciples in Luke 12, 25 not to be anxious. He says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? So the obvious answer there is, no one can do this. No one can add a single hour to the span of his life by being anxious. So we're wasting energy. Stop wasting energy. Stop being distracted from obedience by the things over which you have no control. The tree is going to fall where it falls. The clouds will rain where they will rain, and you can do nothing to control it. Furthermore, you can't control when the geezer bursts, or when your child picks up a tummy bug, or when your aging mother contracts COVID. So stop allowing these things to consume so much of your emotional and mental energy. You can't control it, but praise God you don't have to. Because if you've been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been adopted into the family of a sovereign, almighty God who is much better equipped to control these things than you or I ever could be. So instead, be diligent stewards. Diligent stewards, and we get that from verses 4 to 7. So rather than getting all wound up and frustrated about God's providence, rather, he says, be diligent with the responsibility that God has put in your care. God's sovereignty means that he is in ultimate control over every event of life. And because we know that he is for us, then we can rest in his control. But what God's sovereignty does not mean is that we should somehow adopt a fatalistic approach where we just throw up our hands in the air and wait for things to happen because what will be, will be. No, we are commanded to be diligent in our responsibilities. God, is, God has kindly put these things into our hands, into our control. We are accountable for our actions. God will judge us based on what we have done in our lives. Now, having done what we need to do, then we can rest in God's sovereignty when things go badly because it's happening as a part of God's good plan. But it does not mean that we abandon responsibility. There's an important dynamic that we mustn't lose sight of, this interplay between God's sovereignty on the one hand and the, the rest and the freedom that we can feel in that and taking responsibility for that which he has given to us on the other hand. Solomon says, As you do not know the way that the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. So again, reasoning from the unknown to the known. You don't know these things, but because you don't know all these things, therefore you must be humble and live in light of God's power. That being said, he goes on to say, He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So, live humbly in light of God's sovereignty. You don't know whether your crop is going to, to bring forth a harvest. But don't simply observe the wind and the clouds. Do something. Instead of just throwing up your hands in frustration... You don't know ultimately whether this thing is going to succeed or not. Instead of getting uptight about the things you can't control, Solomon advises us to take responsibility for the affairs of our lives. Because you don't know whether your crop will grow, therefore, don't put all your eggs in one basket, plant two crops. Because you cannot control how your boss will react, therefore, ensure that you approach him with the proposal which is well thought out and an attitude which doesn't sound critical and unappreciative. Because you cannot control the emotions of your child, therefore do not provoke him to wrath and ensure that you're creating an environment or an atmosphere in the home which is conducive to obedience. Because you cannot control the traffic on the way to your meeting, leave extra early so that you can counteract any potential delays. Because you cannot control your spouse's behavior, focus on controlling your own emotions and responses. I could go on and on. Christians must not, must not live lives constantly blaming others, complaining, and pointing fingers. We as Christians should be best at living in light of God's sovereignty while also taking diligent responsibility for those things which God has put into our control. 
Think of that parable that Jesus told in Luke 19 about the servants who were given the, the miners, the, the money. Before the, the master leaves on a long journey, he leaves miners, 10 miners, in, in the hands of his, each of his servants. And he tells them to engage in business until he returns. And he commends those when he comes back who invested that money wisely and got a return. Regardless of how much they made, he commends them for their diligence. Um, but then he severely rebukes the, the one who, who simply did nothing with what he had been given. So from that, I, I conclude God clearly expects us to turn a profit on that which he has given us to, to be responsible for. He expects us to work hard and diligently steward the resources that he has left in our care. Resources like finances and children and spouse and vocation and talents and relationships and much more. Ultimately, working hard and taking responsibility is a good thing. Solomon says, light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. Work is a good thing because work is how we image God in the world. God worked and as we work, we in one way display the image of God to the world. So work hard at those things that God has put under your dominion. Rather than blame shifting, be looking for ways in which you can control the things that he has put in your control, rather than focusing on everything outside your control. Finally, let's look at some dark days in verse 8. Dark days. Solomon says, so if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, but let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. So life lived in the midst of this vain world, if lived in the light of eternity, can be very sweet. God intends for us to enjoy the good gifts that he has given to us. But we must never live that life in a sin, we must never forget that life in a sin-cursed world is very much a journey from one wilderness to another, as we saw from Numbers this morning. Life can be wonderful, especially when lived God's way. But we cannot fall prey to thinking that God owes us a life of ease and prosperity, because he doesn't. The Stoics coined a phrase called memento mori, which means basically remember death. Death is at the very core of what makes this life under the sun so full of vanity. Death is the great equalizer. No matter whether you are the nicest person in town or the serial murderer on the news, death comes to all. And that's because all sins. None of us escapes because all have fallen short. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we know that the wages for our sin is death. So that doesn't minimize the wickedness of some sin. But the fact is none of us meets the standard. And at death, the death that we look forward to is the great vanity creator. But praise the Lord that for Christians, those who've put their hope and trust in Jesus, we have victory over the grave. Ultimately, death will not have the final say. Death has lost its sting. But the reality of physical death and a life filled with dark days remains until Christ comes to make all things new. And this should be a constant reminder that we, we should be trusting servants, diligent stewards, generous with all that God has given to us. But our ultimate satisfaction cannot be found in this life or in the things of this world. So enjoy life. After all, Solomon says, it's pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. Be content with God's sovereignty. Work hard and be diligent with the responsibilities that God has given to you. But don't look for life under the sun to provide you with more meaning and significance than it was meant to. In their place, there's many good gifts that God has given us to enjoy in this life. But we can only truly enjoy them as we are looking to God himself, the giver of good gifts, to satisfy us eternally. If we're investing in the kingdom and not in this vain world then we can be satisfied in God eternally. In this world, and perhaps especially for the believer in this world, the days of darkness will be many. So live life in light of death. And as you remember that death comes, so you will also remember the vanity of life under the sun. So look to Christ, and in Him find fullness of joy and meaning and significance, which will enable you to live life under the sun to the glory of God. Let's take a moment just to reflect on the truth of God's word and then I'll lead us in prayer.
Father, I thank you that you didn't leave us in this vanity, that you instead sent your only son to do what we could never do in living a perfect life and dying a sacrificial death on our behalf. Lord, we thank you that for so many of us, we've experienced the, the wonder of your Holy Spirit making all things new in our own hearts already. And we look forward to the day when we will no longer see the vanity of sin and decay all around us. Lord, we look forward to the day we will no longer see sin in our own lives. Lord, we pray that you would please help us to be godly stewards of all that you have given us. Help us to trust you. Help us not to be frustrated at your providence. Help us to diligently do uh, all the things that you've given us to do, to take control of the things that you have given us control over so that we would be able to turn a profit on what you have given us, that we would glorify you here on this earth. And Lord, we thank you that you've even promised us a reward later, a reward we, we don't deserve. We deserve nothing but your wrath, and yet we believe you, and we put our faith in your word, which tells us that we, you will reward us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would please help us to live in light of death, help us to remember that this world will not ultimately satisfy, and I pray that you would please display your glory as others would look at our lives and see that we have our hope in something far beyond the things and the experiences of this world. And we pray this all for your name, in Jesus' name.